Hi, welcome to our last segment related to Roman um, architecture and art. Um, in our last segment, we've been looking at some of the monuments and artwork and architecture um, that was started by um, these great um, emperors, um, um, you know, during the Roman Empire. The last one we talked about was Trajan. Um, this one that we're going to talk about now is um, Hadrian, and you're looking at a portrait bust of him. Um, and Hadrian was a ruler who fancied himself an architect as as and was the patron of many important Roman monuments, um, the most famous being um, the Pantheon um, temple that we're going to look at in a little bit, um, and, and that's connected to him. He, too, like Augustus, was a great admirer of Greek art and wanted to associate he himself with that golden period. What you're looking at now is an aerial view of the Pantheon. Um, this is the Roman temple that we're going to be looking at. So it is important that you do know some of the, the Greek temple architectural terms because those will apply, but we're also going to learn um, some new ones, in particular this, this dome as well, which is, a, is an innovation in architecture um, done by the Romans. Um, and here are some more views of the Pantheon. Um, so this is probably one of the most famous monuments in ancient history. Um, the structure has a defined axial point where visitors could only enter one way. So obviously, you know, through this um, portico here. Um, it originally had steps in the front. So again, the steps are both an Etruscan um, and, and sort of Roman convention. Um, there's a colonnade of eight columns that adorn the front of the structure, so that's very reminiscent of a Greek temple. Um, these structures were designed so visitors would only see the temple from the front facade. Um, not till they walked in would people see the dome or the rotunda. So this is a dome that they built, and then sort of the interior is what we call the rotunda, which is an unexpected magnificent space. So the way this was originally designed is that when um, ancient um, worshipers would approach the temple, they wouldn't be able to see the dome. They would only be able to see this sort of Greek temple facade. Um, and then when they entered the building, here's another view of it, um, they would be sort of overwhelmed by this um, unexpected space. So here's a diagram of, of the interior and, and the structure of the temple. The size of the structure was 125 feet from the floor to the oculus. So that's a new term. An oculus is a sort of opening in the dome that allowed rain and sunlight. Um, and it comes from the Latin oculus, which means eye. And again, this denotes a circular opening in the center of a dome or in a wall. The original temple was commissioned by Marcus Agrippa during the reign of Augustus. Um, so this was the site. Um, and then it was rebuilt by the Emperor Hadrian about 126 AD and then dedicated to Agrippa. So one of the things too we talked about with sacred architecture is that often, you know, the site, the location has some sort of sacred meaning. And so this does apply. The dome is 20 to 25 feet thick and was created using a mixture of mortar, lime, stones, tufa, and volcanic ash. The recipe for this mixture changed from heavy to light as the height of the dome increased towards the apex or oculus. So here it was, you know, the mixture would be heavier and then it would be sort of a lighter mixture as it approached um, the oculus. Builders made the mixture lighter by adding pumice and empty clay amphora, or pots. Um, the use of coffers, and these are these sort of sunken in spaces that you see here, and they, they look like decorative panels, also help um, lessen the dome's weight without weakening the structure uh, and providing a handsome pattern of squares with a square within a vast circle. Um, so this was quite an innovation, um, and again, this would not have been um, possible without this sort of invention of concrete um, that we talked about earlier. 
you would not be able to make a dome or span that kind of space with just post and lintel. Um, although the shape of the dome seems simple, it incorporates a sophisticated design and engineering. So again, the Romans were excellent engineers. Um, there's a marble veneer and two tiers of richly colored architectural detail um, that describe, that sort of um, disguise the sort of concrete and sort of the internal brick arches um, and concrete structure that form the dome. So remember, whereas the Greeks would have made the entire, <laughs> or would have tried to make the entire structure out of stone and marble, um, what the, the Romans do is that they use concrete and then they'll use like a, a veneer or a layer of marble outside of that concrete to, to make it look um, decorative and beautiful. And that's what they did um, with this dome. Again, um, I need you to know um, these terms. The portico is sort of the porch. Um, that is a Greek, um, a Greek architectural feature of a temple. Um, the Greeks would have had an additional, probably, temple or portico on the other side for balance. Um, and then here we have this new architecture. So the rotunda is sort of the interior space. This is the drum. This is sort of the base of the dome. And then you have this sort of stepped dome. This is, I guess, allowing, um, this is sort of um, showing you the, the, the concrete and sort of the interior um, structure that's not visible. Um, the coffered ceiling and then the oculus. So those are some new architectural terms that you need to, to learn because they will pop up in other um, architectures from different um, time periods and historical um, groups. Here's another sort of diagram to give you a sense of how magnificent the space was. Um, so this Renaissance drawing suggests each coffer once had a glistening bronze rosette at its center. Um, enhancing the dome and the starry heavens. So let me see if I can sort of zoom in here. So again, when you entered this structure, and we'll actually look at some actual vid, um, the interior real images, but um, again, it had this sort of concrete, you know, it was made out of concrete, but then it was sort of covered with um, beautiful marble inlays and, and travertine and different colored marbles. Here in the ceiling, it, it was gilded um, with bronze, and it seemed to have sort of, um, and also this sort of blue um, coloring, and then in, in, there was a bronze rosette at the center, and it sort of resemb resembled like a starry sky or the heavens, and again, that's what it was supposed to represent, this very heavenly, um, sacred space. All right, um, I know we're looking at a lot of diagrams. <laughs> um, the Romans believed that perfect geometric forms symbolized perfection. So they were sort of in line with the Greeks in terms of that idea of math and beauty and proportion. Um, we see the integration of the square and circle throughout this structure. So that's an important theme that I need you guys to remember when you're talking about this structure. So you do, you have this structure, you know, the circle within a square, and then even through the interior, um, as you can see, like the, the, the pattern of the marble, the squares of the coffers, the circles, you know, the circle and square motif is really, um, really um, sprinkled um, throughout, not only the actual structure where you have a circle inside a square, but, you know, the repetition of that motif in the decorative program as well. Here is an actual view, I think. Yeah, this doesn't look like a drawing. <laughs> Hard to tell sometimes. Um, the osculus um, was about 30 feet in diameter, so it spanned across that space. Um, and also had, um, was also useful because it helped remove weight from the dome. Um, so, you know, as, as in addition to being decorative and beautiful, it also functioned um, in terms of um, lightening the load of the dome. 
um, this let in sunlight, it also let in rain. Um, there were actual drains installed in the floor um, and the floor was slightly concave to collect um, and drain rainwater from the oculus opening. So they really did think about everything and every little detail. Again, here's another drawing. And what's beautiful about this osculus is that as the day progressed, the light from the dome moved across the interior and created beautiful cast shadows and reflections throughout the day. This is a this is another drawing. Um, so you could see how at different times of the day that sort of that that disk of light would kind of move um, all over the architecture, the interior of the rotunda. Here's another view. Um, and so here's the actual space. And again, it's it's hard to see this in a two-dimensional image, but it really is quite spectacular. I've been there, and it really is amazing. Like you enter, and then the space is very overwhelming and very unexpected um, if you've never been before. And, and it was designed to be that way. Um, and so the architects really wanted the feeling of you entering um, a sacred, heavenly, um, you know, world um, beyond, you know, our earthly, um, you know, existence. Um, and so they, they created this by, you know, the space, the dome, the osculus, um, you know, the, the obviously the lux, um, you know, use of marble um, as a layer of decoration. Um, but it's quite spectacular. So it really was meant to kind of give that feeling of being overwhelmed as the viewer entered the space. And that's one of the reasons, again, I want to point back to why the dome wasn't visible, essentially. So as a worshiper approached, they wouldn't see the dome the way it was set up with the stairs originally. And they would just enter through that sort of, you know, typical Greek um, temple facade. And, and then they would be sort of overwhelmed with, the, with this unexpected round space. And so viewers almost always back up um, when they first enter the structure. Since the dome is hidden when first approaching the facade, the massive round space of the rotunda, again, provides this sort of unexpected and overwhelming space. Um, the beautiful architectural decorations as well as the lighting from the osculus also serve to make the space seem more unworldly and sacred. Again, as if the viewer has stepped into a heavenly place. So one of the things I want to, us to distinguish is this difference um, between, the essential difference between Greek and Roman architecture. Um, one thing is that Greek builders revealed the building material itself um, and accepted design limitations, especially with, with the post and lintel construction. And so again, this is um, you know the post and lintel, um, two posts and a horizontal lintel. You can see that with the Greek and post lintel construction, especially with the Parthenon. And again, don't get these two structures confused. The Parthenon is Greek, the Pantheon is Roman. The Pantheon has the dome. And so, again, the Romans being innovative and engineers um, and the discovery of concrete construction led, um, you know, Romans the ability to experiment with um, barrel vaults, groin vaults, um, and then eventually this dome with an os osculus. Um, so Roman builders exposed only an externally applied surface covering, the sophisticated structural underpinnings that allowed um, Huge spaced molded by three-dimensional curves are set behind the decorative facade and hidden from view. So the term pantheon means all gods. Um, so the temple was dedicated to all of the Roman gods and goddesses. Now with the Parthenon, the Greek temple, it was dedicated to the goddess, um, the Greek goddess Athena. All right. 
Um, so what you're looking at right now is a bronze equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. Um, he was one of the final great emperors during the sort of golden and hot period or the, the high um, period in the um, Roman Empire. Um, bronze equestrian statues became very commonplace for imperial portraits during the Roman Empire. Not many survive, however, because they were usually melted down during the Middle Ages as Christianity took a hold as the dominant religion. Um, this particular statue was mistakenly thought to be the Emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor during the late period of Rome for many centuries. This mistaken identity is probably, probably what saved the statue from being destroyed. Later, the identity of a statue is attributed to one of the high emperors, um, Marcus Aurelius. Um, Marcus Aurelius is portrayed riding the horse bareback. The horse and rider seem in sync. The proportions are strange. Notice how large the horse is, but Marcus Aurelius is even larger. His legs are hanging too low. These unrealistic proportions are designed to express the idea that Marcus Aurelius is larger than life um, and has total control of the horse. Um, so the statue functioned as another form of um, political propaganda. As in Roman fashion, his facial features are individualized and specific with a head, a thick curly hair, and a full beard, which was sort of the fashion. Um, the, the beard was actually initiated by Hadrian, the emperor um, who designed or helped design the, um, the pantheon. I like, to think of, I like to think of Hadrian as sort of the hipsters of the, of the Roman emperors during the high empire. Um, and, and the beard was actually supposed to represent um, or resemble traditional um, philosopher portraits from the Greek world. This is a recognizable portrait of Marcus Aurelius. Um, he is portrayed barely holding on the reins of the horse, again signifying his control over the horse's will. Now, I'm, I'm showing this to you. It's not on your official list of 250 works, but we are going to be confronted with other um, this motif of, of an equestrian statue. And so this is one of the first ones and I wanted to show, show it to you so we have it as a, a point um, to reference back to when we um, confront these other, these other equestrian statues or portraits and, as well as paintings. Um, here's another view of it. And another reason why I'm showing this to you is because it's Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> it kind of screws everything up. Um, you know, before there was a system in place where um, these um, emperors were groomed. They, they weren't necessarily leaving the empire to um, a blood um, relative or a blood heir because, you know, a lot of times they weren't competent. Um, so there was a system established um, and for some reason, Marcus Aurelius decided to break away from that system and actually left um, the empire to his son Commodus. Um, and he managed to destroy the empire within 12 years um, and, and just did a hor he was a horrible emperor and, and just, just kind of messed everything up. And, and so the Roman Empire starts its decline after the reign of Marcus Aurelius. So there's a whole, you know, there's a whole lot of art that goes into that period. We don't have time to look at it. So we're going to kind of go in, into the late Roman Empire. Um, and so this is the, the age of Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor. Um, what happened with the decline of Rome is that barbarian groups began moving into the empire during the time of Marcus Aurelius' reign. Um, and now um, they sort of press the Roman frontiers um, and their borders um, with these barbarians. And they actually began to settle with the bound, within the boundaries, dis disrupting um, provincial governments. As perceived threats grew, imperial rule became more author author authoritarian, and eventually the military um, controlled most of the government and deposed um, rulers. So actually, I'm going to stop here um, because I, I'm leaving out some stuff that I think is important that I need to kind of um, 
so this next piece makes sense to you guys. So I'm going to stop here. We're going to we have uh, one more piece, one more official piece to look at, but we have a few more pieces to look at before that. That'll they'll help. That'll help put that last um, piece into context and give you a little bit more information about the late empire. Okay. So this is not our last <laughs> lecture. Sorry, um, but um, this is next to last. So stay tuned.